Right. Hello, hello, everybody. It's Rochelle from Artful Leadership, and we are back for another Artful Leader interview. Um, this series has really been a wonderful way to tap into the wisdom of folks leading at the intersection of education, arts, healing, restorative practices, social justice, and really find a way through together through this crazy challenging time that we're in and really make a shift in the way that we do business and education. And my work, which many of you are aware of, is really about supporting educators to impact lives sustainably by putting your own well-being first so that you can really lead with a full tank, so that you can also create a culture of community care that can support students and staff through all the challenges of working with young people. And so that is why I'm so excited to have Claudine Miles here today, who is um, the co-founder and CEO of Restore More, a firm that is impacting the social emotional learning of young people in schools, school districts, and in families through restorative practices. And this is a practice that I'm really passionate about. And so I was really excited, Claudine, when you said yes to this conversation. So I'd love for you to just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, your work, how did you get to restorative practices and you know what you're excited about? So, hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for having me in this space. I was equally excited when you asked. Um, and I come to this work uh, by way of being an educator first. Uh, so started teaching sixth grade science. Um, it was funny because I did not major in science. I majored in English, and that was a learning curve for sure. Um, but I always credit my what became really good teaching to having to learn it first myself. Um, from there, I then started the founding gifted program at my school, um, making sure that we cultivated space for those high achievers and then transitioned to the dean um, or assistant principal. And so within that role, I had the opportunity and got introduced to restorative practices, um, went through the training myself, not under the guise that I would be implementing at my school, but just to become more knowledgeable about it. And then my principal was like, I could so see you leading this. And I was like, oh, really? Do you? Could you? Um, and I think it wasn't a hard sell because for me, it felt like things that I had been doing for a while, but potentially giving more of a structure and helping others um, to build relationships meaningfully in a way that maybe they hadn't thought of before. And so through that, I became the Dean of Restorative Practices and had the privilege of transitioning that school that I had been at for 10 years from punitive to restorative. And then in 2018, um, I decided to make a transition, uh, leave that school that I loved so, so much and step out on faith and start an organization called Restore More, where our central mission um, is to uplift people through wellness strategies nationwide. And we do that by focusing on restorative practices, social emotional learning, anti-racism and teacher wellness. Uh, these are the four uh, core aspects of our work, the issues that we care most deeply about and that we also enjoy teaching most about. So it's been a dream to be able to create a, an entire organization um, that revolves around the things I love to do. I feel really lucky and privileged to um, do the work that I do. That's so exciting. So, so your work now is really helping others to shift from that punitive to restorative model, I would imagine. Yeah. And do you have any like exciting success stories or things that have happened that have just continued to inspire you and propel you as you continue to build your business? Absolutely. Um, so many. I, I have like student versions, right, that really deeply inspire me and then like teacher versions or adult learning versions. Uh, so I'll start with the adult learning versions. Yeah. Um, one of the schools that we're working with, we have had the, the joy of working with them since the very beginning. So this school leader reached out to me two years ago and said, I'm founding a school. I want it to be anti-racist and restorative from the start. I want it baked into our policies. We want to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, but we don't know how to do it. And that's where you come in and help us to build the systems, uh, build the policies, build the handbook to ensure that it's really well aligned. And 
with COVID over the last year, we hadn't got to see the school in person, right? Because everything was virtual and online and you lose some of the essence of um, what it is to walk the halls in a situation like that. And so what's been really exciting is this past week, they've gone back to school, they are in person. Um, I am getting pictures literally every day of kids circling. I'm getting screenshots of like, teachers going back and forth about how much they love circles, something they learned in a circle, um, students saying that they love circles and things like that really motivate me to keep going. Um, yeah, because yeah. unlike teaching, unlike teaching this work, you get the gratitude a lot sooner. Like with our students, sometimes you're waiting like 18, 14, 12 years before you get that. Thank you. That was so meaningful when you did that in fifth grade. Um, yeah. But with educators, you see that impact so immediately because they're implementing it right away and knowing that it's helping kids um, to build healthier relationships with adults. Like, that's just my jam. So, yeah. Yeah, that is super exciting. And for folks who are new to restorative practices, you mentioned circles. It's something that I'm really familiar with. But can you talk a little bit about, like, what are some of these restorative structures or practices that folks are implementing that are so powerful with this, this approach? Yeah, great question. So for us, like when we're training um, with educators or leaders, we're training them on some of the core components of restorative practices. So affective statements, how we speak to students when we're communicating strong feelings, uh, whether they be positive or negative, uh, there is a way that is more constructive that can actually push students to give us the desired behavior uh, that helps us to model like emotional consistency. And by simply saying something like, um, when you do this, it makes me feel like this. In the future, can you try this? Something as simple as that talking stem for teachers is really transformative because we've heard in the past lots of yelling, right? Lots of griping. And so by giving them an alternate frame where finding that teachers are feeling calmer, uh, they're able to be more sustained because they have this like very tactical way to communicate when they're triggered or annoyed. And we know our students bother us sometimes, but if I have a go-to way to articulate that and teach them, like social emotional learning at the same time, that's really valuable. Uh, we also discuss proactive circles and how to um, have those group moments where everyone can build and get to know each other on a really deep level. And then we talk about the restorative questions, right? Um, what happened? What were you thinking? Who's been affected? And what needs to happen to make it right? And how you can use those to have restorative conversations with students when an issue has occurred. So we try to hit on the uh, main tenants so that when teachers are entering classrooms, they're well equipped with skills and we give them opportunities to practice. We let them see videos where it's gone really well. We let them see videos where it's gone miserably. Um, and, and we use those as like evaluative measures to grow their own practice. So those are some of the things that they are like learning and gaining as we walk them through our training. Yeah, yeah. And what I loved in, in my training in, in restorative practice is the focus on building community first, right? And how important it is to have those relationships online, to, to be in right relationship with, with one another and have these structures in place where we're connecting, we're getting to know each other, we're deciding together what kind of community we want to have. And then when things go sideways, we already have those relationships, right, that we can lean into. And we already have sat in circle together to be like, hey, today we need to talk about some stuff that's not working for us. And we already have all those skills of working together that we can like all that capital, right, that we can lean on that I, I love about the circle um, and, and modeling with the effective language and everything is so important because we expect young people to have all this knowledge about how to express their feelings appropriately, and they don't. We're Most just, adults don't know how to do that. So to be don't. fair, I'm like, let's back up. Most of us as adults struggle with that, especially if it's like a close relationship. So we've got to teach our kids. Right. But my point is like, we're expecting kids to do something we don't even know how to do. And so it really is so important for us to, to practice those things. And I think that's a great segue into like the title of our little talk, right? Which is like restorative practices starts with you. Right. And so I know both of us are really passionate about educators really starting with their own well-being and their own healing. And I would love to just hear from you like, why does that matter to you? Where does that start? 
where does that show up when it's not on board? You know, all the things. <laughs> Right. So restorative practices, well, it definitely starts with the individual. It is a, a, a process, right? It's not a program. So in any process, there's, there's like this continuum, right? Where you can evolve and get better within the practices. And so I think first it's understanding like, where am I as I show up today? And we only do that through being introspective. So it's like giving people opportunities to say, okay, here's what restorative, here's what a restorative mindset looks like. How close are you to this? Or are you actually further over here, right? So it's giving them opportunities to hold that mirror up to themselves and say, where am I in that process? And I think wellness is such a huge part of this, right? Like ultimately we want educators to stay in the work and be committed to the schools that they're in if they serve them, the students that they're uh, serving. And that's not often the case. We know that educator turnover is real. We know currently we're facing a national teacher shortage. There are sub calls for like almost every content in every state. Like it's really wild right now. I've seen some things where subs are getting paid like two to $300 a day because it is such a demand to get seats, qualified people, right? In the seats in our classrooms. And the reason many educators are leaving while some might assume it's low pay and that's problematic. Yeah. But the yeah. number one reason we hear is I'm burnt out. Yeah. So burnout is very real. I personally left my role due to burnout. Mm -hmm. um, I was working 90 hours a week. I had a company cell phone where I could be contacted. It started ringing as early as 530 about bus issues and delays. And it rang up until 11 at night about discipline issues that were occurring at home, online, on social media. And so there became a point where I knew I'm hitting a wall and I've got to back up and care for self. And though it wasn't um, a, a quick decision, it was something I had to mull over a lot. In that moment, that is ultimately what I needed to be mentally, emotionally, socially well. And there are many educators that are in that exact seat now. And so for us, it's about providing content, messaging, um, validating the work that they do, showing gratitude for all that they do, um, showcasing how they can actually do this work sustainably for the long term yeah. through all the lessons that I didn't implement, right? <laughs> right. So I can tell you what not to do. And then I can also tell you like, what are the things that actually sustain you after speaking to thousands of educators across the country who have done it for 30 plus years? Like these are the things that they are doing to sustain themselves. And so if we adopt some of these practices, then we too shall be more likely to stay in the work if that is what we desire to do. So for me, I just believe that um, when educators are well, the students will be well. And we absolutely have to take care of educators better in this country, country in general. Um, and so for us, we actually do trainings on teacher wellness where we talk about their triggers. Uh, we talk about their emotional backpacks and things that they may need to unpack. Uh, we practice having crucial conversations. Uh, we dig into their identity and different challenges um, that they may have experienced and traumas that they might be bringing to the classroom that can be triggered by students and then creates a cycle, right? So we try to prioritize their wellness, give them healing tools, um, and walk them through ways to stay engaged in this work because it's hard. Yeah. So hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important. And then some of the stuff that I really do a lot of work on is how do we as teams do that together? Because I think, especially this year, there's been so much pressure of like, you need to take better care of yourself. You got to take care of yourself, but it doesn't take into account that there's a whole culture, there's a system, there's a whole uh, paradigm in education that works against that. Absolutely. Right. And that is very harmful to folks in educational settings. And so when we can come together, we can build a culture together and we can do those restorative spaces and practices together, then we can also start to reimagine the whole institution, right? And we can really start doing things differently so that there's less of that having to do that by ourselves, but that we really start to heal the way we do business on a whole. And that's, you know, that's something I'm so passionate about is like, it's not just me over here, like doing my morning meditation and my yoga and my matcha tea or whatever. Those are all great things, right? But like, how do we come together to really design systems for flourishing and 
for, you know, making this sustainable over the long haul. And that's where I love like shifting to restorative practices as a whole organization can be such a powerful part of that process. Yeah, I love that you kind of rooted that in collaboration. I think collaboration is going to be a big part of the solution. Um, Sometimes the work of teaching is so draining and it's because we're doing it in silos. If we collaborated more, it'd be less work and we'd have more bandwidth. Um, And I think healing oftentimes works in the same way, right? And so no matter what, in any of our trainings, whether it's on anti-racism content or wellness, like we create space for restorative practice circles because people need that like communal bonding time and we've missed it so much in the last um, 18 months. So Yeah. 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 Super, super important. So um, as folks are moving into this new school year, um, you know, what are your thoughts about things that, that pract- you know, practitioners, educators, leaders, decision makers, what are the things that they can start to prioritize so that we can, you know, build that wellness for the individual, for the interpersonal, for the institution? You know, just what are your thoughts on that? I think if you don't have a plan to address the social emotional learning of your students, um, it's high time to start. I know here in the South, um, we are back to school. My son started last Monday. Um, I've been training educators all over the Southeast for the last six weeks um, for the pre-service and the onboarding times. And so they are kicking it into full gear now. Mm -hmm. And so if you are one of the lucky ones who are maybe like further out in the country and haven't started yet, yeah. and you haven't developed that plan or your school doesn't have a school-wide plan, uh, do yourself a favor and just think about how am I going to integrate um, yeah. opportunities for wellness into my classroom. Our kids are hurting. I don't care if they're five. I don't care if they're 25. Like it right. has been a rough year for all of us. If I'm being honest, many of us are hurting. And yeah. so we need to create space. A great way to do that is restorative practice circles uh, because they're structured, because they teach skills Uh, social emotional learning skills because they help students develop agency because it helps you to know things about your students that you would have never uncovered in a typical class like I've learned things about kids that I'm like I would have never known that had we not had this circle and it's bonded us in a way that I can say um, is really deeper than any other practice I've seen because of the things that you learn because sometimes the movements are so powerful you're moved to tears with your students, but it's a safe space and that vulnerability is welcome. Sometimes you learn about something someone is working on and everyone rallies around and supports them. So there's all these little micro moments that just create um, such an amazing team culture. And so that is probably like my number one suggestion. If you don't know anything about circles, please look into it. It's really easy to execute. They're no longer, um, you can necessarily, or excuse me, you can um, have short ones up to 20 minutes. You can have longer ones up to an hour. So time can be flexible. Um, And at Restore More, we actually have scripts uh, for the educator who feels like, well, I don't have the capacity to make my own plan. I think it's best to make your own, if I'm being honest, because kids will start suggesting questions and topics and then you let them lead it. But we've also been really, really mindful to understand that like a first year teacher may not have the capacity for that. Right. But they want to bring these practices into their classroom. And so we have a uh, circle script set with like 24 scripts that cover a bunch of different topics that are great for middle and high schoolers. And then we have one that we created last summer in the midst of all of the racial unrest, um, which is the anti-racist circle kit. And so what's great is you're not teaching in those moments. You are showing up as like Claudine or Rochelle or whomever, and you're being your authentic self and you're asking questions and listening to their thoughts. Like you share first and you model being vulnerable, but this isn't an opportunity for you to give feedback to every student and judge their answers. It's listening deeply and making meaning about what people are saying and just affirming that they shared. That's it. So I would love for y'all to check those two things out because they make it a little bit easier if you want to start it uh, and start the work, but maybe are a little apprehensive about how. Mm -hmm. So where would they find those scripts? How would they get a hold of that material? Both of them are on our website at werestoremore.com. Okay. I will put that link in the comments. Thank you. 
Yeah. And then folks can grab those. It's so important. I think one of the things that I hear a lot when I'm encouraging folks to do circle time, and I'm sure you deal with these questions or, or resistance, um, is this like, I don't have time for that. Or, you know, I've got my lesson plans or I've got this thing that I've got to do. And so I'm always pushing back on that about how valuable it is to take a little bit of time to to spend with your students and how much value you get on the other end, right? Of like getting to know them in those ways you're describing and having that sort of social capital that you can lean on when stuff goes down because now you've got a relationship, right? But I'd love to hear from you, like, what do you, what would you say to someone who's like, oh, I don't have time for that or I'm not doing all that. You know, what do you see as a benefit? Like, what are they able to build on the other side that makes that? really meaningful i have an answer i'm processing (laughs) and thinking about how i want to word it um because those teachers who often come with the i don't have time um in my experience Mm -hmm. tend to be approaching education from a mindset about what is useful to them right? Versus what is useful for students. And so I, in thinking about students of today, think about what's useful to them. Developing the ability to articulate their emotions in constructive ways, that's useful. Developing the capacity to have empathy for other people, that's useful. Developing the ability to listen deeply and empathize with others, that's useful. And so while you may dismiss it as something that you don't have time for, your kids need those skills. Your kids need you to make the time to develop those skills. And when we develop them, oh my, it makes teaching so much easier. I say this all the time. um, When your students love you, they will do anything for you. And when they dislike you, they will make your life a living hell. Like we've all been there. We've all been there. And so in all of the research and pedagogy that backs up this method of relationship building, discipline, um, community building, I just think it's worth the invested time because we are trying to create a world of better humans. And when I look at how the world looks today and I think about the skills that they gain with restorative practices, I'm like, how could you deny your students these skills? They need them so much to be competent in what we are leaving behind. So for me, it's just, how could you deny them that? Right. And if we want them to learn new things, if we want them to grow, if we want them to be flexible, um, us too, we have to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I love a few things that you said where it really comes from a bigger vision of like, what, what kind of world are we creating as educators? And um, the world really needs these skills. You know, when we look at where we are, especially here in our country with so much division um, and, and folks on different sides, not able to- They're not talking, nobody's talking to each other. Not able to talk, not able to listen, not able to, to have empathy and not able to be vulnerable. All those things are huge investments in the future of our nation when mm. we spend time building those those practices for ourselves for communities for students so I love that you kind of tapped into that and um and like what are we really here for you know are we here to like teach a test right or are we here to really invest in the in the future through the lives of these young people so that's that's just so important Um, also can I add one other thing oh go for it I also think you know when you're dealing particularly with like students that have experienced high levels of trauma and Mm -hmm. or um, students of color, particularly black and brown students, Mm -hmm. this method of engaging with them and relationship building is so transformative. It is so healing. It repairs so many of the wrongs that have been done before. Um, And one of my favorite circle topics is like, tell me about your last teacher. And it's just an opportunity for students to share their prior experiences. And in that circle, I always learn so much about the emotional baggage that our students are carrying just from their seven, six, five years of schooling, yeah. right? So they're already coming to us with these fears and anxieties about who we are, how we're going to judge them, how we're going to label them. And when you sit back and listen, it can just help you approach the situation in a way 
that ultimately is that much more intentional for their benefit. Right. Well, and I, I love that you brought that healing aspect because I think that's one of the things that that is so important. A lot of times I think in schools, mental health has kind of hap- uh, handled as this sort of like separate thing. Like you need to go away and go talk to a therapist or go be in a group over there and get your shit together. <laughs> and, then, right? and then come back. And then come back. And then, you know, as long as you're not a pain in my butt, you know, we can, we can work together. But I think the thing that is really missing is that so much of the healing that is needed is community and is healthy attachment and healthy connections and healthy relationships with others that like, and I worked as a therapist with youth for many years individually and was like, this ain't going to cut it. Like me sitting here for one hour a week with the student is not what's going to create a a real change in their life. What's going to create a change in their life is different relationships with the folks who have authority over them, them Mm -hmm. having new relationships with their friends in class and knowing, oh, I'm not alone. You're going through this too. Like, oh, you have the same dreams and aspirations. Oh, your dad's also in jail. Oh, you slept on the, you know, on the ground in that part. Cause I worked with youth, you know, who are unhoused, but it was like building community and having that sense of like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. We can do this together. That's where the healing really happens. It's not like alone in a room somewhere thinking about it. Right. It's in relationship and teachers are always saying, well, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist, but, and you don't have to be, you get to create a safe space where those healthy relationships can happen. And then that transforms so much, you know, and our teachers, um, it's funny because we had the teachers who said that initially. Right. And I was like, well, okay, let's try it. Let's stick with it. Let's see how it goes. Um, when we were implementing it at my prior school and in the end, they were like, this has been such a great part of our day. Like they loved circles because they were like, I could let my hair down. I could dim the lights. I could put music on. I could set the tone. And it just felt like I was talking with like really caring, quality young people versus I'm the teacher. I'm authoritative. Do as I say. And they could let their shoulders sit back for a second. And we all need more of those opportunities in schools to slow down. This allows us to slow down and really check in, in a way that again is meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. And like one of my favorite teachers is Dr. Sean Ginride. And he talks like that shift that we need to make from transactional relationships to transformative relationships and that sort of top down relationship that's, you know, defined by power dynamics is not where the healing and the change and learning and growth is going to happen. It's going to happen in that space where there's trust, where there's vulnerability, where there's, you know, understanding of each other's strengths and what we contribute and what we can create together. You know, that's really, you know, when you talk to anybody about what was impactful to them when they went to school and what teacher made a difference for them, that's what they're talking about. They're not going to be like, oh, I had this teacher who did math in a really Great. You know, sometimes it might be connected <laughs> usually. My favorite teachers are like the ones that put in the extra effort that made me feel seen, cared for, heard. Um, all of these things we can do through these circle practices we're talking about, right? Uh, but those are the ones that stick out for me. Uh, yeah. It's not those that were the best teachers or those that had the best lesson plans or those that had the highest test scores. I could not tell you a right. single score of any of my teachers, but I could tell you who made me feel important. I could tell you who listened to me. I could tell you who helped me and encouraged me and motivated me. Um, And likewise, I could tell you those who were mean, who said things that were hurtful and harmful, um, who ostracized children. So just really thinking about like, what's the legacy I want kids to speak on uh, of me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just in kind of like, to kind of recap some of the things that you're saying folks can really focus on as they're, you know, heading into this year is really having a plan. Oh, yes. Because like, I, you know, and I, when I do trainings and stuff all the time, people are like, oh, I'm going to be more open-minded or I'm going to like be more. And I'm like, no girl, you need a plan. Like, where are you going to embed these things? What time of day are you going to do what? Like, and who's going to do what? So you need a plan. You need to slow down. You need to get in circles with your kids before bad things happen and build relationships and community and show up as your full self in that space. 
And then is there anything else? Is Start that- scheduling your self-care. Schedule that self-care. So I'm a big proponent of using my calendar. Yeah. Um, I have like the written agenda and then I also have like Google calendar, but I literally schedule self-care. So if there's a week that's daunting, that's coming up, then I'm going to put in a block of self-care time. Um, And it looks different for everyone. Um, I talk a lot about the different components of wellness and how on different times you need different things to pick you up. Right. Uh, But even just seeing that on my calendar, a two hour, one hour, 15 minute block for self-care. I know that's my time. I'm going to take it. And sometimes we need to take it in the moment when triggers or emotions get us, but sometimes we need to plan for it, right? So don't be afraid to say, oh, this is going to be a rough week. I'm intentionally not going to do anything this Saturday. I'm vegging out and I'm putting my phone on do not disturb. Like do those things that you need to do for you this year is going to um, probably be equally as hard for educators based on this um, lovely Delta variant that is hanging out and whatever other letters we might get, Lambda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, the more we can plan to take care of ourselves, the more likely we are to do it. And then I love what you said about just earlier, sometimes the systems in schools don't promote wellness and self-care. So having like strategic conversations, I think is really powerful for educators in coalitions, like speaking to administrative teams about how fatigued the team is when that issue does come up, because it will come up and say like, what are some things that we can do to mitigate this. I know at one point in my school, we had put in like a flex schedule where one person on the team could come in late on Friday mornings and it rotated every five weeks, but that was a huge thing for educators. It was like, oh, one morning where I could sleep in or do work or do whatever, Um, but really communicating what you need, not only to parents, but also to your um, superiors so that they can work to make it happen uh, because they're serving you too. So just encouraging that. Yeah, I think that's so, so, so important. And I, that's one of the things that I learned so much from restorative practices is like, you know, conflict is going to happen. You know, stress yep. is going to happen. You know, challenges are coming. So be prepared for oh, it. What? Have a system that is ready for that and not like, oh my gosh. <laughs> ah, they are going to keep coming. We work with hundreds of people and I alone have plenty of conflict by myself. So think about <laughs> multiply by hundreds of people. That's just life. Right. Right. Yeah. And so how do we be prepared? How do we have that emergency plan or how do we set up those proactive systems so that things don't go off the chain like that so that, you know, we're able to manage those things, I think is so, so, so important. Um, So I'm curious, you've talked a lot about self-care. What is like your go-to or do you have like a menu of things? It sounds like you might have a menu of things that you go to when you're like, I need to really take care of myself. What do you do? So I have a self-care plan. It's based on uh, six different facets of wellness. So like spiritual, uh, physical, emotional, intellectual, uh, social. And so under them, I just have like bullet points of things I like to do, right? So physical, it might be like jump rope, ride my bike, go swimming, take a hike, all things I like to do. But on a day where I'm feeling depleted or even just like after work, just cause, um, I'm like, okay, what area do I need something for? And I try to do at least one to two small acts of self-care a day. Um, and we, implement it at Restore More, like into our culture. So we have a weekly meeting in the weekly meeting. I'm like, what's everyone doing for self-care this week? And then we debrief every day. And I'm like, okay, what are you doing for self-care tonight? And then I'll check in the morning. Did you play that video game? Did you take that walk? Cause my team is unique. They all have these different things that they like to do. Did you make that new dish, Narafi? Um, but I'm making sure that they're committing to themselves because just as important as it is to do the work, like we can't do the work if we're not well. And this work is draining. Yeah. Um, it's really tiring because you're helping people to find healing. So it's, it's exhausting. And then coupled with the anti-racist work we do, if we don't, uh, take care of ourselves, then we are no good to anyone else. And so for me, it's doing it intentionally. It's daily. Um, and it's just trying to best understand when I'm feeling depleted, what I need to pick me back up. Yeah. And I love what you said, because I'm so passionate about leadership too, is that as a leader, you're embedding that, that accountability, that you're not just asking them like, what are you doing to work? But you're also, what are you doing to take care of yourself so that you can keep doing this work, right? And I think that is something that leaders can really implement is checking in with their teams on like, 
what are you doing to take care of yourself? So I love that you're leading by example in that way. Um, something that I really like to ask folks that, that come on the, on the interview series, um, kind of as like a closing question is, what's something that you really wish all educators knew or some message that you would like to share with, with all educators? You are so important. Uh, you are so valuable to the definition of school. Um, you are the single most important determinant in a child's success. And you have more power than you realize. You have the power to ignite dreams and students will manifest the things that you tell them that they can do. Mm -hmm. And so take that charge really seriously because you are that valuable, despite what anyone um, has ever told you, like you really do matter that much and the work is really that important. Um, I had a student, I used to teach sixth grade science, right? She got her white coat this week. And so I was so excited. She's starting med school, like a really big deal for her. And so I like reposted it. I was just like so proud when I see students uh, manifest their dreams, right? She had always said, I want to be a doctor. And she then shared in response, it was your sixth grade science class that made me fall in love with science. Didn't really care for it before, but you made it so fun. And you told us we could do anything. And I really believed you. Thank you. And it was like, ah, this is the thankful message we talk about getting 16 years later. Yay. Um, but when I say it is that serious, it is. The things you say today will play in the heads of children for years to come. Let the recording be a good one because it will play. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> All of that. That was beautiful. Um, well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. Um, we will make sure that folks go and check out WeRestoreMore.com and get your resources that you have. And especially if you're here on the West Coast and you're interested in really prioritizing wellness for your team, um, that's what I do with Artful Leadership Coaching and Consulting is really training this, but then also walking with you through the whole process of how do we implement this work. And, um, and I know that Claudine and the folks at Restore More are also doing amazing stuff at the national level and out of Georgia. And it's just so great to meet with a kindred spirit and yes. um, share in this important work and this movement towards, you know, a, a new paradigm shift in the way that we do business in education. So thank you for being on the, on the journey with us. So great to meet you. And I hope this is the first of many great conversations. Likewise. Thank you again. All right. Thanks everybody.